Thank you very much. On March 19, 2011, there was a wedding held in Durham, North Carolina. Like most weddings, it had brides and grooms, it had vows, it had flowers, it had tuxedos, it had dresses, it had cake. Unlike most weddings, it had 1,600 brides and grooms, and they weren't marrying each other. They were marrying the city of Durham. In what was called the, the largest mass civic union in history, 1,600 people committed their, themselves to the city of Durham. Their vows included things like uh, promises to keep the, cle the streets clean and safe, to vote local, or excuse me, to, to buy local, to vote uh, responsibly, to protect the environment, um, and to uh, essentially love and, and commit to their community. What was also interesting was the fact that this was done entirely by volunteers. There was no official city action in this. And they decided that they were going to raise some money for some local charities, and they set a modest goal of $12,000. They more than doubled that goal and raised over $25,000. About this same time in Detroit, Michigan, there was a public art project that was trying to get off the ground, but it wasn't like your typical public art project. In February, Mayor Dave Bing uh, received a tweet from some well-meaning person saying, suggesting, why isn't there a statue of RoboCop in Detroit? RoboCop being actually set in Detroit. To which the mayor politely but tersely replied, thank you very much, there is no plan for a RoboCop statute in Detroit. It was too late. An idea was born and a meme was created, and within a matter of hours, people were buzzing about the idea of a statue of RoboCop. So instead of uh, uh, going out and forming um, you know, a typical task force and whatnot, they created a Facebook group. And within a matter of days, thousands of people joined that, and they decided instead of going to the city or asking for an Arts Council grant, they decided to crowdsource uh, the funding themselves. They set up a Kickstarter account. Within a matter of a couple weeks, thousands of people had joined the Facebook group. It had gotten national media attention, and despite what people uh, described it as irony run amok, they raised over $67,000 to build the statue of RoboCop. What do these two things have in common? Well, they begin with people who are in love with their cities, citizens who go above and beyond and do extraordinary things uh, for their places. And every place has these community development assets, and these are true community development assets that live amongst us. Every place has people that love it. What's interesting, though, is the state of that relationship. And the Gallup organization, in conjunction with the Knight Foundation, tried to figure out what is the state of our relationship with our cities. From 2008 to 2010, uh, they conducted what was called the Soul of the Community Survey. They interviewed 28,000 people in 26 cities and asked them that question. They found out the state of our relationship. And it turns out the state of our relationship is pretty bad. 40% of us say that we are not attached to our places. 36% say we're neutral. And just 24% of us say that we're attached to our community. And attachment certainly isn't even love. Why do so few people love their cities? Well, I think it has to do with public policy that has encouraged us to become monocultural enclaves, that privileges the car uh, over actual human connections, that has turned our urban landscapes into transit corridors instead of neighborhoods. Um, add to that bad and uninspired design, years of civic neglect, and you have what James Kunstler calls places not worth caring about. Do lovable cities matter? It turns out they do. Gallup found that the places with the highest levels of emotional engagement also had the correspondingly highest levels of GDP. They also found a significant relationship between loyalty and passion to a place and the local economy. Now this shouldn't surprise any of us. We all know that when children are loved, they thrive. So too with pets, plants, and objects. And yes, I do mean objects. Think about the car. Most of us own a car, and to us it's, it's an object. You know, it gets us from point A to point B. We occasionally uh, do the, the scheduled maintenance. We wash it every now and then, but it's an object. But think about the car of somebody who loves cars. This is the person that's out there waxing the car with a diaper on the weekend. They change the oil even when they're not driving. They've invested some of themselves, their own identity, and their emotional content into that car, and it shows. When we invest something of ourselves and our emotional content into our cities, it shows too. For a long time, we've thought about the idea of, of human capital, social capital, finance capital. And we track these things, and we measure them as part of our city's overall health. We need to add emotional capital to that uh, agenda. We also need to figure out how we add to and subtract from that particular bank. Places that have high levels of emotional capital are going to be able to weather this economic storm far better. Um, when places have people that love it, they're far less likely uh, to, uh, to complain as much if you have to close a school, if you have to start charging for uh, using a park, or, or perhaps cutting library hours. 
Places that have people that love it have people that start things like Mary Durham and initiate projects like the RoboCop statue in Detroit. Places that are running on empty are already adding pain to an already bad situation. Those that can may leave, and those that have to stay, well, they're probably going to blame the local officials and make them pay in the next election. They may not even wait till the next election, as evinced by the rash of recall elections we've seen around the country in the last couple of years. So how do we increase the love? Well, I think we have to understand what it is we both love and hate about our cities. And I've been asking this question for years. What we hate about cities tend to be big things. Things like the transportation system, like traffic, like parking, like sprawl, bad design, and of course, pothole-filled streets. Things that even if you fix them, and it would take a ton of money to fix them, they don't engender love. Think about it. No one ever fell in love with a place because somebody fixed transportation, because somebody fixed parking, and somebody filled in all the potholes. It just doesn't work that way. There's more to a city. Think about how much money we spend on those things, yet we get very little return on that particular investment in terms of emotional equity. When polled, people will say that the one thing that, they really, that really annoys them about the city is the potholes. So of course, politicians respond to this. Well, I kind of liken this to the fact of uh, it's like a hangnail or a paper cut. They're irritating, yes, painful, kind of, uh, but they are hardly life-threatening. Um, what we're seeing with these kinds of things is that politicians have become obsessed with the idea of filling in potholes. The idea of the scope and magnitude of things has shrunk down to this particular service. And that has become the issue. We are focused entirely on things that make the city safe and functional at the exclusion of everything else. Now, I understand how politicians wrestle with this. Um, it's hard to be, uh, you know, you don't want to appear to be insensitive and you certainly don't want to appear to be frivolous. So they say no to everything that makes a city livable and engaging. Things like arts, culture, beauty, design, landscaping, and events. If a place is merely paved surfaces, police and fire service, there is nothing that keeps us in one place versus another. We need to expand our definition of essentials and at least consider adding a little bit of beauty, fun, and engagement to the ledger. It doesn't cost a whole lot of money. In fact, what it takes is creativity, imagination, and at least an awareness that these things are important. What we tend to love about cities tend to be small things, intimate things. They tend to be a view, a particular street corner, uh, a dog park, uh, a certain time of year, movies in the park. I equate these things to the chocolate on, a, on the pillow, the cherry on top of the sundae, and the handwritten note that goes with the flowers. And gentlemen, you know that the handwritten note that goes with the flowers is actually more important than the flowers. I call these elements love notes. Their cost is incidental, but the way they make us feel about our place is hugely exponential to that cost. A couple of examples. Pedestrian-friendly Times Square. About two years ago, they initiated this. They closed off one of the busiest intersections in one of the busiest cities in the world and made it into a pedestrian enclave, and it's fabulous. You go there now, there's Wi-Fi, there's places to sit, and it's the ultimate place to people watch and look around in New York City, and that's probably what most of us all we ever wanted to do in Times Square. Before, we were probably risking our lives by looking around. We'd probably get run over by a cab. Also in New York, Highline Park in the meatpacking district in lower Manhattan. They took a mile-long stretch of elevated railway and turned it into green space. And you wouldn't think that just being two stories above the city totally changes your perspective of the city, but it absolutely does. It is a wonderful respite in an otherwise very busy part of town. It makes you feel like you're in a completely different place. And in the grand scheme of New York, it's a small thing. Millennium Park in Chicago, this is a big love note. This is 12 dozen roses, a giant box of chocolates delivered in a Lexus. There's no doubt about it, $475 million. But the key thing about Millennium Park is that it engages us and it invites us to play. You go up to Cloud Gate, also known as the Beam, and you look and find your, your reflection in it and you take your picture there. You play with it. You go to the water fountains and during the summer, the water fountains are basically like an outdoor pool for kids. They're running around, they're having a great time. Play is incredibly important in our personal relationships and it's incredibly important in our relationships with our city, but we don't necessarily think of it that way. A little bit uh, smaller scale, something a little bit more manageable on today's budget. Street pianos began in Birmingham, England, when a gentleman couldn't actually move his piano up to his new flat, so he left it out front, put it on the street, and put a sign on it that said, play me. And again, an idea and a meme was born. People would come around the piano, they'd play, they'd gather for an impromptu jam session. It was wonderful. Some artists took this idea and they created the Play Me, I'm Yours uh, project, and they moved these street pianos and they've literally moved all around the world. And it's a wonderful moment where you come together, somebody sits down who actually knows what they're doing, great. 
Somebody who doesn't, great, it's still fun. And it's a wonderfully simple way to surprise and delight your citizens. A little bit closer to home. The new Tampa Museum of Art is a fabulous love note to the people of Tampa Bay. But I have to give them credit for adding some things that I think are maybe even more touches, little nice touches that we think about. It's the dog run in the back, and it's the playground out front. Two small elements, and I'm sure during the planning session someone said, do we really need that dog park, and, and isn't that playground really just a, a lawsuit waiting to happen? <laughs> and fortunately somebody said, no, these are important. And think about it, as high-minded as we'd like to think of ourselves as going into the museum, and it is fabulous, um, we're probably more likely to use the dog park and that playground on a more regular basis. These are wonderful little love notes to the city of Tampa. Even closer to home. The Saturday morning market here in St. Pete is one of the reasons why so many of us who live here love St. Petersburg. It is where St. Petersburg comes to meet itself. On Saturday mornings, uh, about 10,000 people will show up, 120 vendors. It has become the largest single day market in the southeast. Uh, a fabulous love note to the city of St. Petersburg. People can be love notes as well. This is Bob Devin Jones. He is the creative director of the Studio at 620 here in downtown St. Pete. And Bob is a living love note to the city. He is a central node in, the, in what makes the city of St. Petersburg, but he doesn't show up in any, any typical city org chart. Uh, but Bob's impact on the city is quite profound. And if you look in your own cities, you will find people like Bob. You know these people, they're out there. In Tampa, it's my friend Julia Gorska who uh, started uh, Brand Tampa. She's become the definitive Tampa girl because she wanted to promote local awesomeness. In Detroit, it's the folks who started Robocop. In Durham, it's the folks who started Mary Durham. These people do extraordinary things above and beyond for the communities. They make our communities livable, lovable. They make us the kinds of communities that we want to stay in. They are amongst the most powerful of spices. And people who cook know this metaphor. I don't really cook, but I understand I, I do eat. <laughs> powerful spices, you don't need a lot of them. You just need uh, the right mix and maybe just a little dash here, a little dash there. It goes a long, long way. The problem becomes is we haven't really valued these people. We think that, you know, that that's just Bob being Bob, when what Bob does is absolutely extraordinary. We have to start recognizing these people as the anchor personas in our community and start treating them as such. Because think about it. If a major business or a major institution was about to leave St. Petersburg, the city council would fly into action, the mayor, the economic development uh, teams, the chamber of commerce, they'd figure out a way to keep them here with, uh, with tax incentives, land deals, and things like that. What if we were about to lose one of our anchor personas? What could we do? Almost nothing. We're not really set up to play that particular game. In order to play that game, we at least have to recognize that these individual people have an outsized impact on the quality of life that we all share in St. Petersburg, and in every city, actually. How do I know this? How do I know that one person can make a big difference? Because Wikipedia tells me so. <laughs> and not for that reason. It's in how Wikipedia was actually made. Most of us here, I'm sure, have used Wikipedia, but do you realize that less than 1% of the total users of Wikipedia have actually ever made a contribution or a journal entry or an entry to Wikipedia? Less than 1% of the people who use Wikipedia built the entirety of Wikipedia. We're talking about millions of man hours, all unpaid, all volunteer. And during my, uh, when I was researching my book, I interviewed Jimmy Wales about this, and I asked him specifically about this, and he said he was not surprised. He said, no, the people who, who invest themselves in Wikipedia, it's interesting work, it's challenging, it's something that helps the, their own identity. They project themselves into it. It becomes a love object for them. Think about that and how that applies to physical communities as well. I believe the same 1% rule probably holds true, that 1% of our, 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 our people are actually making the content that the rest of us consume. All of us consume cities, and that's not a bad thing. In return, you know, we obey the law, we pay our taxes, and we spend money in our cities. That's the deal. But there are a few people, that 1%, who are actually making the content that the rest of us consume. And so I propose maybe a slightly different thinking in terms of how we go about community and economic development. What if we were to focus on this 1% and maybe try to change and recruit more of those folks? In St. Petersburg, we have roughly 245,000 people. If 1% 1, 1 of that is roughly 2,400 folks, what if we were to add just 10% to that number? 10% more of the co-creators, the makers, the great lovers of the cities. 10% more, 245 more Bob Devin Joneses. What would be the exponential impact on the city of St. Petersburg? And that to me is exciting. That to me is the new math of community and economic development, particularly in these tight economic times. We need to rethink how we go about community and economic development because we don't have the resources that we used to have. 
We used to have lots of money, so we could throw things around and it would be like net casting, where you throw a giant net into the ocean and you pull out all of that good stuff. And you pick the things that you want, and you maybe toss the other stuff away. We don't have that luxury anymore. We have to become more like this spear fisherman, in the water, highly targeted, highly patient, and very, very selective about what we go after. The gap between the city that we desire and the city that we can afford is growing. We all know it. Into this gap, I believe you're going to see the people who love cities, the 1%, the co-creators. They will be the ones who step into this breach, and they will be the difference between cities that survive and even thrive and cities that fail and despair. When we love something, we do extraordinary things for it. We sacrifice for it. We fight for it. Emotions matter. Emotions tell us what to value. If three quarters of us do not value our communities, it says, it says something terrible. It says we don't care. And when we don't care about something, it becomes disposable and we can easily walk away from it. We need to recognize that we are in a proper relationship with our cities. And when we do that, we add the human heart to our toolkit of community and economic development. And that, I believe, will prove to be the most powerful tool ever in making livable and lovable cities. Thank you very much. Just gonna get out.